I am really excited to bring uh, my friend, um, Bill Wees. Bill, hello. Hello. Great to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to have you uh, again. I had the opportunity to host you at Hungry Generation, where uh, you came with your wonderful wife and you shared your journey and your story. I've heard your, of your story from the book, read the book, and um, from other uh, friends as well. And I was really moved by your not only conviction uh, to God's Word, but your devotion to Jesus and your devotion to being a minister that will last in the journey of walking with the Lord. Your eating habits, just, just your very militant, spiritually militant, disciplined um, behavior. And uh, that really impacted me as a young minister and impressed me as well to study the Word to memorize scriptures and to really take care of my body, my mind, and my soul to last in the ministry. So I just want to say thank you for that. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, you're welcome. Now, um, Bill, could you start from the beginning? How did you come to know the Lord? Um, did you grow up in a Christian home? Um, what was your personal, what was your encounter with Jesus at first? And when did you accept the Lord as your personal Lord and Savior? Well, a friend actually led me to the Lord, um, but it was right after I had um, an event where I got attacked by a shark. And uh, I can tell you about that later, but God delivered me, saved me from death, from the, the shark, grabbed my leg, pulled me down under the water. And so I knew it was God. Mm -hmm. I didn't know him then as uh, I was uh, raised as a Catholic, mm -hmm. but I didn't know Jesus personally. And so I was 17 years old then, and then a friend of mine told me about Jesus Christ, that I needed to repent, ask forgiveness for my sins, and invite Jesus into my heart. So I did that in um, April of 1970. So I've been a Christian for 53 years now. Mm -hmm. and, um, it's been the best 53 years of my life, that's for sure. But uh, that's where I first got saved. And when this experience that I had about hell, that happened 28 years later. Okay, so 20 so years of you walking with the Lord, 28 years later. Right, mm -hmm. and I was serving in our church. I taught here and there at the church, not on hell, but on different topics, and uh, I led worship and so forth. So I was very involved in the church, but also I just always have studied the Word. I, I love the Word of God, and after this experience, I really delved into the topic of hell to find out if everything I saw was scriptural. Mm -hmm. because that's what's important mm -hmm. so your life before this experience uh right. what, what were you involved in professionally and did you have ever have visions before no first of all i was a real estate broker i've been a real estate broker for 50 years with my own company and um, my wife also worked in real estate for a builder so we both were in a professional careers at this time uh, i was not a minister but um th that's when this happened, then it caused us to leave our careers mm -hmm. and then travel full time mm -hmm. in the ministry. So we've been doing that now full time for 17 years and part time for seven years before that. Mm -hmm. so, so can you describe that initial, that experience? Take us through that day, that night when you had that experience where when, when the Lord um, gave you that vision. Right. Well, we went to a prayer meeting that we attended every Sunday night. Nothing unusual about the night. Uh, came home from this prayer meeting and went to bed like any other normal night. And I'd got up at three o'clock in the morning just to get a glass of water. And suddenly I was pulled out of my body. As I was walk walking through the living room, something grabbed me and pulled me out of my body. I saw my body fall to the floor. And I started tumbling down this long tunnel. And it was getting hotter and hotter. And then I landed on an actual stone floor in a prison cell in hell. Rough hewn stone walls, bars, filthy, stinking, dirty prison, but like a dungeon. Uh, but Isaiah 24, 22 mentions that, Proverbs 7, 27, Job 17, 16, uh, Jonah 2, 6, and many other verses talk about the prison cells in hell. And that's where I first found myself. Now, Vlad, I was fully awake and cognizant. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was just like I'm here now. And I wondered, how did I get here? Why am I here? And it wasn't explained until the way back, but... Uh, the first thing I noticed was the intense heat. It was like a blast furnace. And I wondered, mm -hmm. how could I be alive in this, this unbearable heat? And so my reaction was I wanted to get up and run out of this prison cell that I was in. But I noticed I had no physical strength whatsoever. It took so much effort to move 
And I thought, what's wrong with my body? But Isaiah 14, 9 and 10 says, hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, art thou become weak as we? And Psalms 88, 4 says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. Mm -hmm. So if you ever felt weak from the flu, well, it's mm -hmm. a thousand times worse than that. Any movement takes tremendous effort. But Acts 17, 28 says, in him, we live and move and have our being. Mm. So movement, movement comes from God. It's not automatic. Wow. Well, I looked up, I saw these two demons in the cell, mm -hmm. uh, reptilish in appearance, bumps and scales all over the one's body, a huge jaw, sunken in eyes, uh, claws were about a foot long. And these particular two were about 12 or 13 feet tall. That's not an exaggeration. There's scripture for that even, uh, but I'll keep moving. And they were mm -hmm. pacing in the cell like a vicious caged animal. Mm -hmm. They had the most ferocious demeanor about them and they were blaspheming and cursing God. We know blasphemy comes from the demonic realm. Mm -hmm. Revelation 13, 6, James 2, 7, and some others. But then they directed this hatred they had for God. They directed towards me. I wonder why, what have I done to them? But the one demon picked me up and threw me into the wall of this prison cell. Uh, tremendous strength demons have. You have none. I collapsed. I felt as if every bone in my body had broken. But now maybe a spirit doesn't have bones, but it sure felt that way. And I have to explain one thing, though. Mm -hmm. The Lord explained that he blocked most of the pain. He didn't allow me to feel all of it. He Just a small amount so I could relate to people. It's not metaphorical. It's not a state of the mind. It's real literal pain you're going to feel in hell. Anyway, this other demon in the cell picked me up, dug his claws in my chest, tore the flesh open. Again, I thought, how could I be alive through this? I should be dead. Mm -hmm. But I noticed I had a body. Matthew 10, 28 says, fear him who was able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Luke 16, the rich man wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue. He had a mouth to speak, a tongue and eyes to lift. So you have a, a body, mm -hmm. but it withstands these torments. Wow. But something else I noticed, there was no blood or water coming from the wounds. It was just mm -hmm. all dry. Mm -hmm. But Leviticus 17, 11 says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood. Wow. And then Zechariah 9, 11 says, Thy prisoners out of the pit where there is no water. There's not one drop of water in hell. And these demons have no mercy over you whatsoever. They have an extreme hatred for you. Mm -hmm. But Psalms 103, 17 says, The mercy of the Lord is upon those that fear him. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't fear him in hell, so you don't derive the benefit of uh, mercy. About this time, Vlad, it went dark. Now, I believed it was God's presence there to illuminate it so I could see. Mm -hmm. But then he withdrew his attribute of light and it returned to its normal state. Absolute pitch black darkness. But but Lamentations 3, 6 says, he has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. Jude 13 mentions blackness of darkness forever. But mm -hmm. it wasn't just dark. You could literally feel the darkness. But that's not an exaggeration. Exodus 10, 21 mentions a darkness that may be felt. Mm -hmm. It's just so evil and wicked. It just seems to penetrate through every cell in your body. And then I was taken out of this prison cell. I was placed over next to this large raging pit of fire. This pit was about a mile across. I just understood that. Uh, like a huge hole in the ground with flames raging high up into this open cavern. And again, it wasn't metaphorical or allegorical flames. Mm -hmm. I felt the heat. I saw the fire. But more importantly, it's what the scripture says. Mm -hmm. Psalms eleven six says, upon the wicked, he will rain fire and brimstone in a horrible tempest. Psalms 140, verse 10, let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits. Matthew 13, 49, Isaiah 33, 12 through 14. Many verses I could give you on the fire, but Vlad, this is where I could first see people. Mm -hmm. See through the flames mm -hmm. and I saw the outlines. It looked like skeletons of people and they were screaming at the top of their lungs, burning. And you could not distinguish a man from a woman. Uh, that the screams were so loud, but Isaiah 57, 21 says, there is no peace, saith my God to the wicked. There's no peace of any kind in hell. But, you know, if, Isaiah 32, 18 says, my people dwell in a quiet resting place. Mm -hmm. You're not his people. She don't mm -hmm. even derive the benefit of quiet. Mm -hmm. But, you know, most of us have never seen a person on fire. I mean, it is horrendous to see that and uh, the screams and so forth. And demons were shoving people back in and they have no strength to even fight them off at all. And um, so that's, I saw that. I thought about my wife up on the earth. I knew that I would never get to her again. I could never say goodbye. Job 7, 9 says, he that goes down to Sheol shall come up no more. I understood that. And you don't realize how tormenting of a thought that is to have no finality with your family. You can't say goodbye. And they don't know that you still exist. 
See, death does not mean cease to exist. Death means you're separated from God. You still exist. Mm -hmm. I understood I was down deep in the earth. I descended to get there. I ascended when I left. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, there's 49 scriptures that point out where the current hell is. I'll just give you two. Mm -hmm. Ezekiel 26, 20, number 16, 32, and 33. Very clear. Uh, also, I understood there were different levels of torment and degrees of punishment. But remember, Jesus said in Matthew 23, 14, you shall receive the greater damnation. Mm -hmm. That infers a lesser. Or Hebrews 10, 28, of how much worse of a punishment. Suppose it shall be for you, you have, who have trodden underfoot the Son of God. There's a worse punishment. But my point is there is no comfortable, tolerable mm -hmm. level in hell. Mm -hmm. The level is far worse than your mind can conceive. Wow. Uh, you have no purpose. It's just a complete useless wasting away. Mm -hmm. uh, Ecclesiastes 9, 10 says there's no work, nor, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. And and this, the, another thing that's so horrible in hell is the foul, putrid, disgusting odor. Mm. Jesus rebuked the foul spirits, mm -hmm. Mark 9, 25. They have a disgusting, foul, decaying odor to them. Mm. But also the smell of, it smells like burning flesh mm -hmm. and also burning sulfur. And if you go to Hawaii to the volcano, uh, they have signs posted where you cannot go past a certain point because the toxicity coming up from the volcano, it's called sulfur dioxide. And uh, if, if you breathe it, it will kill you. It's toxic. Well, sulfur is just another word for brimstone. And the br word brimstone's mentioned 14 times in the Bible. So you're breathing in this foul, putrid, disgusting air. Uh, but it's even worse than that because there's not enough air to breathe. You have to fight for even tiniest bit of oxygen, you know, but Isaiah 42, five says the Lord gives breath to the people upon the earth. You're not upon the earth. You're down deep beneath the earth. God's very specific with his word. Mm -hmm. and, and just a couple more things. Uh -huh. you, you need to sleep in hell. You never get to go to sleep. Uh, Revelation 14, 10 and 11 says, uh, and they shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the lamb and in the presence of the holy angels. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Mm -hmm. Now, that primarily means no rest from the torment, but also no rest of any kind, because Isaiah 57, 20 said, the wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. You know, mm -hmm. the sea's always moving. Mm -hmm. It can't rest. But again, rest is a blessing from God. Psalms 127, 2 said, the Lord gives his beloved sleep. Well, you're not mm -hmm. his beloved. Mm -hmm. And uh, anyway, uh, there were, I, I was standing beneath this tunnel that was ascending upward, and there were demons all on the side walls, the cavern walls. Some were only two and three feet tall, some 12 and 13 feet tall, twisted, deformed, and grotesque. There were snakes, and I was standing on a bed of maggots. But uh, Isaiah 14, 11 mm -hmm. says, where the maggot is spread under thee, and the worm will cover thee. Mm -hmm. Look it up in the original. It's the word maggot. Mm -hmm. You know, I never knew this, but when a dead animal is being eaten by maggots, after they consume the flesh, maggots die. Well, that's why Jesus said where their worm dies not, he used the word maggot, because the flesh is never fully consumed in hell. So as Job 24, 20 says, the maggot will feed sweetly on thee. Wow. I mean, is that disgusting enough? You're hungry. You never get to eat. You have the feeling of hunger, thirst. Remember the rich man, Luke 16, mm -hmm. he wanted one drop of water that he'll never get. So the thirst is unimaginable that you enduring and, um, you know, you, you have to endure this, uh, just watching people burning mm -hmm. and demons attacking you and so forth. I mean, it's, it's beyond any kind of description I can really give. Mm -hmm. So you but, were uh, first, you, you landed in this prison and then you were shown, you were, you went through this place where it's a lake of fire. You were consciously yeah. aware that you were coming down into the center of the earth. And, yes. and then you were coming up when you were leaving and you quoted the scriptures where the Bible talks about it being located in the center of the earth. Were you, do you think that this was the future lake of fire or this is currently where people are at? This is where currently people are at. I did not see the lake of fire. That's the future okay. hell that nobody is in right now. Okay. And that's after uh, Revelation 20, 12 through 15 uh, is when death and hell, mm -hmm. and he uses the word Hades, which mm -hmm. is the current hell, death and hell deliver up the dead that are in them and they're judged and then they're cast into the lake of fire. So there's basically two hells, the current hell, uh, which is Sheol is the Hebrew word or Hades is a Greek word. Mm -hmm. And so people are in there tormented mm -hmm. and they'll be delivered up and then cast into the future hell, the lake of fire. But you still, so, even in this Hades, you saw fire as well. The people were tormented yes. in it. Yes. 
many scriptures on the fire. Jesus mm -hmm. talked about uh, hell in 46 verses, and 17 of those verses are about the fires of hell. Mm -hmm. So, and, yeah, there's and, a lot of verses. And on were the demons fire. mainly demons and these evil creatures? Were they mainly suffering the punishment there, or they were the punishment upon people there? Well, Matthew Henry's commentary and some others point out that the demons are not in full torment yet. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew 8, 29, when Jesus went to cast out a devil, uh, the dev devil said to him, have you come to torment us before the time? Mm -hmm. So he indicated our time is not yet. Mm -hmm. Well, their time is in Revelation 20, 10 at the uh, great white throne judgment when they're cast into the lake of fire. So meanwhile, they are down in the current hell and they are in torment, but they're only in partial torment, okay. according to most of the commentaries. Mm -hmm. So they can torment you because you're in their territory, and there's no angel to protect you. Mm -hmm. So, so, so it's uh, kind of like, kinda like people who like people who are in hell right now. They're not actually in that final punishment uh, right. yet, but it's already enough that right. preview or that teaser pretty much of what's really coming is already enough that right. uh, lets people know and you shared also the sense of hopelessness were you aware yes. that you're gonna come back and you were kind of in the vision or the lord let you feel the hopelessness of this experience you know the lord blocked it from my mind that i was a christian i was okay. a christian for 28 years at that point but god blocked it from my mind you say where's that in the bible luke 24 16 when jesus appeared to the disciples on the road to emmaus mm -hmm. it says their eyes were holden that they should not know him mm -hmm. john macarthur's commentary and matthew henry's point out they were kept by god from recognizing him god mm -hmm. hid it from them mm -hmm. well god hid it from my mind that i was a christian because if i was there as a christian which i was but i didn't know i would have known praise god he's getting me out of here mm -hmm. I've known that but he wanted me to experience what they feel hopelessness See, Isaiah 38, 18 says, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. And we know Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Mm -hmm. They have no hope for him because it's too late. And so that is actually the worst part of hell. Because your mind, you can grasp eternity there. Mm -hmm. Here we think of time as a beginning and an end. Mm -hmm. But in hell, I understood it will never end. I will never escape this place. And he wanted me to experience that hopeless feeling. And so, you know, that would give me more of an urgency to mm -hmm. witness the people and share with them the gospel because I understand where they're going to go and they won't get a second chance. Mm -hmm. You know, one yeah. second after a person dies, it's too late. They will not get back. And so I grasped that eternity. There was no Calvary coming over the hill to rescue mm -hmm. you. There's no friend to talk to. You can't pray to God. You're just alone and isolated forever in mm -hmm. this place. And um, when when this experience came to an end, did the Lord, you kind of came back or you, you had an encounter with the Lord and he gave you instruction of why this happened? Yes. As I was looking at all this horror, mm -hmm. the, something began lifting me up this dark tunnel. Mm -hmm. So I was ascending up these cavern walls around me. And in this pitch black darkness, suddenly this bright light appeared. Now, Vlad, I knew immediately who it was. There's no doubt when Jesus shows up who he is. But I didn't see his face. I just saw the outline of a man standing in a pure, like a, a holy light. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 it didn't hurt my eyes, but I looked in the light and I, I said, Jesus. And he just said two words. He said, I am. And when he said, I am, I went out. I don't know if I died or passed out. I can only explain it through Revelation 116. When John saw him, he said his countenance was bright as the sun and I fell at his feet as one dead. Mm -hmm. Well, after a time, he touched me and I came to and it hit me so strongly when I was at his feet that if he wouldn't have gone to the cross, I would be in that place for all eternity. Man, I was so grateful for what Jesus did for me that he died a horrible death on the cross to keep me out of hell. I didn't want to ask him any questions. I just want to thank him and praise his holy name. That's all you want to do. And I kept saying, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for taking me to heaven. Oh, I love you, Lord. Thank you for loving me. And But after a time, thoughts started coming to my mind. And he would answer my thoughts. I didn't want to ask him a question, but he would answer my thoughts. Wow. But Psalms 139.2 says he answers our thoughts afar off. And I first thought, Lord, why did you send me to this horrible place? Mm -hmm. 
He said, because many people do not believe hell is real. Wow. He said, even, even some of my own people do not believe hell exists. Wow, I'm getting chills here. Wow. Now, now that at the time I thought, wait a minute, don't all Christians believe in hell? But we have found out since many Christians believe in a teaching called annihilationism. Mm -hmm. That's a teaching that says you simply cease to exist if you deny Jesus. Or universalism, that's a teaching that says everybody gets saved, at least eventually. Or soul sleep, you just go to sleep. There's many false teachings, and he wanted me to point people to the scriptures. Mm -hmm. I'm just a signpost to point them to the scriptures. They don't have to believe my experience. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not here to convince anyone to believe my experience. Just check out what the word of God has to say. What is and, the other uh, thing that the Lord told you of why he gave you that experience? Why? Yeah, that's why he, mm -hmm. he said, because many people, he wanted me to go and share because there's a lot of mm -hmm. pastors today that are not even sharing about hell mm -hmm. uh, because they cannot reconcile a loving God with a God that would allow torment for all eternity. So they just don't go near the topic and they stay mm -hmm. away from it, not realizing there are answers why hell exists. Mm -hmm. And it is reasonable. It's not uh, God being mean or vindictive to anyone. Mm -hmm. So I can explain that yeah, a little bit yeah, further yeah, along. We'll, yeah, but... we'll address that just a little bit later. Yeah, anything else later. that the Lord, anything else that the Lord told you in the in that encounter? Yes, I said, Lord, why did those demons hate me so much? Mm. He said, because you're made in my image and they hate me. John 15, 18, Jesus said they hated me before they hated you. See, demons hate God, but they cannot hurt him, but they can hurt his creation. Wow. That's why Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But he said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So all the destruction, the evil, wickedness, and all that we see today, that's all from the demonic realm, as you know. Mm -hmm. I thought, Lord, um, I don't want to tell anybody about this experience. Mm. They're going to think I'm crazy or had a bad dream. He said, it's not your job to convict their hearts. It's the Holy Spirit's. He said, you just go and tell them. I said, yes, sir, I'll go. But Vlad, I have to admit, I didn't want to share this experience with anyone after I came back. I wanted to witness to everybody, mm -hmm. but I didn't want to share this experience because I'm a conservative person by nature and they're going to think I'm crazy. But I knew the Lord was telling me to, and I got invited to a Bible study. I went reluctantly to share it. He asked me to come share it. I went three months later. And after I shared it at this one Bible study, it spread all over the country. So, so my uh, wife and I started getting invited all uh, over the so, country. But be before we do this, so you come back after this vision into how long did this take place? 23 minutes. 23 minutes. You come back. Correct. How did you because, feel? Did your wife find you? Uh, yes. Did you come back to yes. her? Were you shocked? I mean, were you, how, how did you react to this? Well, I got up at three o'clock in the morning. I looked at our digital clock. When I came back into my body, I was outside my body. The Lord put me back in. Uh -huh. Well, the horrors of hell flooded back into my mind and I started screaming and I went into a traumatized state. Actually, I was in a fetal position on our living room floor screaming and my screams woke up my wife. And the first thing she did was look at our digital clock and it said 323. Wow. So that's where the 23 minutes comes from. But she found me on the floor and didn't know if I was having a heart attack or what it was. And I screamed out, pray for me, pray for me. The Lord has taken me to hell. So she prayed and Vlad, God removed the horror, but left the memory. Now we know he can divide both soul and spirit. So mm -hmm. somehow he took away the horror in my mind, mm -hmm. but left the memory. And you know, if he wouldn't have, I felt that my body was dying. Seeing hell is so severe, it will actually kill you. Our body cannot take that kind of, mm. you know, we hear people in the war that have gone into shock mm -hmm. from seeing horrible things. Well, I definitely, and I was in the best physical shape of my life then, but but God removed the horror. So that's what happened then. And you mentioned you pretty much didn't tell this to anybody. Until no, about... I, I told one friend and then he invited me to his oh, Bible study and I went reluctantly three months later. Wow. So this is not something, you're not trying to write a book start a ministry, you're living your life for the Lord. And one night, you know, you go and get some water and the Lord takes you there. And then, you know, you have all of these experiences. And now the Lord gives you an assignment that he wants you to remind his people that this place is real, as the scripture says, but it's almost like he needs to have that another push, like he did it with Gideon when he told Gideon, you know, I am with you. Um, and and or with others, and then he would send them to listen to the enemy as well, to almost like that reassurance needed to happen. And 
And True. then your wife, you know, she sees this experience that you're having. She prays for you. The Lord takes the horror away, but you have a very vivid memory left. And one of your friend hears about it. And then reluctantly, three months later, you shared this in his Bible study. And next thing you know, you know, it starts spreading like wildfire. And so many people start hearing about this. And, and I love how, if you guys noticed, every single thing that Bill shares is backed up by multiple of scriptures. This is not, he's not basing, he's very conservative man, like he says, he's not basing this on his experience, he's basing this on the scriptures, but experience becomes that confirmation for yeah. that experience. And when it's talking about uh, the issue of why would God allow, you brought this up, very important uh, question that a lot of people are scared of talking about hell. I actually remember Bill, a night before Christmas, so our Christmas service, we had a Christmas service, and I had this, you know, beautiful uh, Mary, Jesus, and um, Bethlehem, Bethlehem story prepared, and some good life illustrations, and I couldn't sleep the whole night, and the Lord started to deal with my heart that there are people there who are not going to live to see another Christmas, and that I need to preach about eternity, and, and specifically that I need to preach about hell has no exits. And I'm like, I, I can't preach that on Christmas. I mean, I'm like, maybe on like some kind of a Halloween weekend, but not on that. And so, and I wrestled, I wrestled and, and yeah, I preached on Christmas service. Hell has no exits. And it was probably, I ruined Christmas for a lot of people, but I felt in my heart, I'll rather ruin Christmas for them, but not ruin their eternity by preaching right. the truth. And I'm not saying that we have to take every holiday and preach a brimstone, no fire message, but I think that we don't have enough preaching on hell than um, we should. Jesus taught more on hell than he taught on heaven, and Jesus preached on that, um, and we don't hear that. I mean, when was the last time that you heard a sermon on that a topic? And so, um, can you speak a little bit about into that on this gospel teaching by Jesus and the apostles on the topic of eternal damnation and eternal separation from God? Yes. You know, Jesus said, Matthew 25, 46, these should go into everlasting life and these should go into everlasting punishment. He used the word everlasting is the word aeonios. So just as heaven is everlasting, so is hell everlasting. And uh, also Matthew 25, 41, Jesus said, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So he talked about hell. Um, but, you know, it's actually a message of love because it's a message of warning. You know, what loving parent wouldn't warn their child not to play in a busy street? Well, that's what God's doing. He's talking about hell, but it's in a, a way like, hey, I don't want you to go there. And I've given you a free will to choose. You can choose not to go there. So that's why we need to let people know it's a warning to let them know mm -hmm. there really is a hell. Because if you don't understand that there's a hell, you may not have any urgency to even get saved, number one. And then as a Christian, you don't really have much of an urgency to walk in the fear of the Lord. You know, you get a little bit complacent, but when you understand the severity of hell, 2 Corinthians 5, 10 and 11, Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. So he's saying, when you understand the judgment in hell in general, you will be more persuasive with men. And that's what it does in us. It causes us to appreciate what we're saved from, to walk in the fear of the Lord, which is, means that we simply obey what the Lord tells us to do. Mm -hmm. And number three, it gives us more of that passion and desire to witness. You know, somebody will pray a nice little sweet prayer, maybe, oh, Lord, save my family, you know, and kind of go about our business. But when you understand how severe hell is, you'll think, man, I didn't know it was that bad. You'll get on your knees, you'll cry out, and you'll say, oh, Lord, give them a dream or a vision. Send laborers across their path to warn them. Oh, Father, be the hound of heaven after them. Don't let them go. I ask you, Father, don't let my family go to hell or my friends. And you'll fast maybe and pray more diligently. And that's what it does for us, understanding this, mm -hmm. this knowledge about how severe hell is. Bill, why does God being loving um, allow um, people to go to hell or send them to hell? Well, he doesn't send anybody to hell. You know, Revelation 21, 8 says, all unbelievers shall have their part in the lake of fire. So there's a warning. He said, if you don't believe Jesus is the only way, as Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. If you don't believe that, then 
he said in Matthew 12, 37, your own words will condemn you because you said, I don't believe the way out. Now, God loves everybody and he provided a way to heaven, but because he loved, he cannot force anyone into it. Mm -hmm. He tells you, here's how you stay out. But if you say, I don't believe it, well, you have a free will to not believe it. But he warned you, if you don't, you will end up in the lake of fire. So that's fair warning. I mean, you know, people have that free choice. So he's not sending them. People's own words condemn them to hell. Mm. And, you know, God's arms are open to the mm -hmm. whole world. He died for the sins of the whole world so that it's not narrow-minded in that sense, salvation. It, he's open to everyone. Anybody can come to the Lord, even if they've been wicked and evil and mean, they can repent and say, Lord, please forgive me of my sin. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And he's so loving. He'll forgive them even on their last breath mm -hmm. and then take them to heaven. So that's the God we serve. People think he's mean to let people go to hell. Well, remember, it's the same God that died a horrible death on the cross to keep you out. So how much more loving can you get than that? Mm -hmm. it's, it's our right? decision, our decision to reject the gospel as you mentioned, um, and Jesus has already provided everything. He sent the church. He's, this stream and this message is um, a conviction to some people to, to come back to the Lord, to receive the gift of salvation. Yeah. Tomorrow is not promised to anyone. Did you yeah. see anyone in hell that you recognized or any people who uh, were believers? No, you know, I... For what God revealed to me, you could not distinguish a man from a woman. Okay. They just look like skeletons. It looked like flesh hanging off their bones to me Ooh. from what I could see mm -hmm. through the flames. Mm -hmm. You can only see through the flames a little bit and along the edges. It's so dark, it consumed all that fire. Mm -hmm. But I, I did not I could not distinguish a man from a woman. And I had no idea if there were Christians there or not. God didn't reveal any of that to me. Mm -hmm. But the one thing I did know was there were no children there. Mm. And three, three reasons. Number one, I could see the outlines of the people and they look like adult sized skeletons. Mm -hmm. Number two, I could hear their screams and you could tell the difference in a child's scream and an adult scream. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, it's what the scripture says. Jesus said, suffer the little children that come unto me for such is the kingdom of heaven. And unless you accept heaven like a little child, you'll not enter. So I believe the scripture is clear that little children go to heaven. Now, I don't know what age the accountability is, mm -hmm. but I didn't see any children there. So that mm -hmm. much he revealed mm -hmm. to me. Some people say that hell is not real because the illustration of the rich man and the Lazarus, which is one of the very common uh, scriptural gospel illustrations that Jesus gave, is just pretty much a symbol and it's not a real story. What do you say on that? No, for two reasons, it's a true story. Number one, a parable has nobody's name in it. All parables don't have a name. Mm -hmm. This has three names, Abraham, Moses, and Lazarus. But number two, more importantly, verse 25 and verse 29 in Luke 16, Jesus said, and Abraham said to the rich man. So Jesus was quoting Abraham as saying to the rich man. Mm -hmm. So if it was a parable, then Jesus would have been lying because Abraham wouldn't have said that if it was a parable. Mm -hmm. So that's proof it was a true story. And then he also said a certain rich man. Mm -hmm. So it's a true story. And also, if you if people argue and want to say it's a parable, which it's not clear, clearly not. But what would the parable mean? A parable is supposed to parallel real life, mm -hmm. in, so to speak. And here he said the man was in torment in the flames. He wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue. He was concerned. He didn't want his five brothers to come there. He knew they needed to repent in order to avoid it. Mm -hmm. He knew he was separated by a great gulf fixed or a gorge in the earth. He could see across and see Abraham and Lazarus, so forth. So he had his sight to be able to see. So for so it, it reveals a lot about that there's torment and there's flames and there's fire in hell. And he was in torment. Four times the word torment is used. Uh, anyway, so it's not, a, it's not an anal analogy. It's not a symbolism. It's a literal place that Jesus was describing of somebody who right. went there. Now, somebody will argue that, you know, this can't be eternal. This this can't last forever. This this has to have an expiration date. I mean, it, this, you know, fire should run out. It should, God maybe will do it for a thousand years or a million years and, and come to an end. And it's just this kind of torment is, is not, God wouldn't just allow for it to be eternal. Hell cannot be eternal. What would you say to a person who say that, well, hell is not eternal? 
Well, first of all, the word eternal is used about hell seven times in the New Testament mm -hmm. and three times in the Old Testament. And number two, when Jesus said in Matthew 25, 41, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. So we just told you you're going to the same place as the devil. And most people accept that the devil is going to be eternally tormented. Well, he just told you you're going to the same place. And then he defined the word eternal because in Revelation 20, 10, it says that Satan was cast into the lake of fire and tormented day and night forever and ever. So there he said eternal uh, is the same as day and night forever and ever. So that's pretty clear. But also, you see, people think that can't God let someone out of hell after a time. Mm -hmm. But see, time, if you said you spend 500 years in hell and said, man, I've, I've paid off my sin. Well, that would be works. And Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says we're saved by grace, not by works. So, so time is the wrong premise. But also our time is not valuable enough to pay for sins. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So our time is not valuable enough. Only the shed blood of Jesus has that kind of value to pay for our eternally deserved sin. And it took an eternal God who was sinless to pay for our eternally deserved sin. Mm -hmm. So it is eternal. And just like heaven is eternal. Mm -hmm. It's the same word used when Jesus said, these should go into everlasting life and these should go into everlasting punishment. So we don't want heaven to be temporal and be thrown out of heaven after a time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same word, aeonial. So both are eternal. Could you speak and, uh, a little bit that's about... That's why it's so horrible. Could you speak a little bit about the the, the few heresies you mentioned about soul sleep, um, mm -hmm. universalism, and um, and other ones where um, yeah, Christians embrace... Yeah, could you kind of speak a little bit into those myths that some Christians have embraced from the world and... There are not right. true doctrines. Well, with like annihilationism, mm -hmm. I mean, you got Luke 16, which we talked about, the man was in hell in torment in the flame. So he still existed. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 14, 9 and 10 says, hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, art thou become weak as we? So they're speaking in hell. Uh, Ezekiel 32, 21 says, the strong among the mighty who were upon the earth shall speak out of the midst of hell. So they're speaking out of hell. Mm -hmm. And then that whole chapter is about um, uh, Egypt and all these different countries that are gone down to hell and bear their shame with those who go down into the pit. And so, you know, and then um, uh, Revelation 14, 10 through 15 all talks about, like I said before, death and hell deliver up the dead that are in them. Mm -hmm. So, and the current hell, that's the word Hades. So, those people are in hell and they're delivered up at judgment day, you know, and then Revelation 19, uh, where the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire. They're the first occupants of the lake of fire. They're thrown in at the beginning of the thousand year period. So mm -hmm. at the end of the tribulation, they're thrown in. Mm -hmm. And at the end, Revelation 20, 10 says they're still there burning a thousand years later. Wow. So. You know, there's a couple... And then the, the first... universalism pretty much which says that every human being will be eventually saved and God doesn't send his children to hell and pretty much we're all God's children and God's going to save everyone. There are quite few, even Christians, embrace that. Right. Well, like uh, Philippians 3.19 says, those who obey not the cross, uh, the enemies of the cross, their end is destruction. Their end is destruction. So that means that they don't get to go to heaven and, you know, eventually they're let out of hell or whatever. Um, Jesus said when he was talking to the Pharisees, he said, I'm getting ready to go to heaven and you're going to seek me, but you won't find me. And where I go, you cannot come. So he just told you, you cannot come. That's in John 7 and John 8. He said also again to the Pharisees, I'm getting ready to go and you'll seek me, but you will die in your sins. And where I go, you cannot come. So we just told them they're not going to make it. So if mm -hmm. universalism says everybody makes it, well, there's two right there that are not going to make it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, Judas, it said it would have been better for him not to have been born. Mm -hmm. Sound good for him. And like I said, those people in, in Sheol that are delivered up and cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 20, 10 says, the, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's where they're going to be thrown. And there's many, Job 15, 30 says, they shall not depart out of darkness. Mm -hmm. 
and not depart out of, you still have to exist. Psalms 49, 19 says, uh, they shall never see light. Well, that presupposes their existence. To never see light, you have mm -hmm. to still exist. Isaiah 38, 18, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. Well, to have no hope, that means you still exist. There's no hope. Mm -hmm. you know, well, and many of those kind of verses, um, Isaiah 33, 12 says, the people shall be as the burnings of lime. They shall be as thorns cut up and thrown into the fire and burned. Who among us shall dwell with the devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Mm -hmm. Everlasting. So they're going to burn everlastingly, just like Revelation 14, 10 and 11 says, and the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Mm -hmm. They still exist to have no rest. Also, it says they'll be in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. Wow. To be in the presence, they have to exist. Wow. You know, a lot of people, uh, Bill, they think when I'll, when they'll go to hell, if the hell is a real place, they'll have rock and roll sex fun hang out with their friends you know the devil rules hell and all of the stuff not realizing that hell is the bible says it's it's his punishment it is not his kingdom it is not he doesn't rule hell he doesn't reign yeah. in hell that's a place of torment for him it's right. god is in charge of that and right. he is sending people there who he's sending satan and demons and satan and demons they deceive people through sin and to reject christ the atonement the forgiveness of sins that jesus gives us and they end up going there um, with satan and with demons but it was never meant to be a place right. for people it was it, god designed it so cruel if we could say and so brutal well because god is holy god's standards are high and that was not a place designed for humans right he designed it for the, he it says in uh, matthew 25 41 hell was prepared for the devil and his angels but he used the word prepared, mm -hmm. which means make ready. It's the same word he used in John 14, 2, where he goes to prepare a place for us in heaven. Wow. So he prepared heaven for us and hell for the devil. But mm -hmm. what he did was, you see, people have to understand this, that he prepared it. So James 1, 17 says, every good and perfect gift comes down from the above, from the Father of lights. Mm -hmm. So all the good we enjoy in life, the fresh air, sunshine, fellowship, drinking, eating, sleeping, all the good comes from God. It's not automatic. So what he did was he withdrew his attributes or his goodness from hell in preparation. So hell's dark because first John 1, 5 said God is light. There's only death in hell because John 1, 4 said God is life. There's only hatred in hell because first John 4, 16 said God is love. There's no mercy in hell because Psalms 36, 5 says the mercy of the Lord's in the heavens. There's no strength in hell because Psalms 18, 32 said it's the Lord that gives us strength. There's no water in hell because Deuteronomy 11, 11 says water is the rain of heaven. And there's no peace in hell because Isaiah 9, 6 says he is the prince of peace. So you see, if God removes himself from the situation, all the good goes with him. You can't have the good without God. You can't separate the two. So if a person wants nothing to do with God, well, there's a place prepared that has nothing to do with him. Wow. Now, other than one thing, other than one thing, the fire in hell does represent God's wrath. All through the scriptures, it says he will pour out his wrath on sin in the form of fire. That's the fires of hell. Mm -hmm. But God poured out his wrath on Jesus on the cross so we wouldn't have to take that wrath. Amen. So you can either let Jesus take it or you can take it. Amen. Wow. Oh. That, is, that is such a beautiful gospel presentation. If you do not want anything to do with God, God will grant you that wish. God honors your human will. Um, any human decision, if you do not want anything to do with Christ, with God, there is a place that absolutely has nothing of God. Because, you know, when we are on this earth and how you presented it, we don't realize how many of these gifts, they come from God. The light that we experience, the air, the joy, and all of that. People think that they can take all these gifts that are part of God's nature, God's presence, um, many of His omnipresence on this earth, he pretty much is sustaining everything with him right now and he will create a place where none of that will exist and it's pitch dark it's torment right. it's a hate it's it's yeah. it's that place of isolation and you know who would want to be in that place and unfortunately so many people are headed there what do you say bill to people who especially in catholicism who believe in purgatory who believe that there is the place in between uh where you die 
you go to a place and somebody here on the earth can make some little atonement for you, say some prayers, and then God will pretty much gonna take you from that place. Uh, can you speak a little bit into the finality and uh, pretty much when you die, it's it's done deal. You, you don't have this second chance when you are in hell. Well, like I said before, first of all, uh, Matthew 25, 46, again, Jesus said, these should go into everlasting life and these should go into everlasting punishment. He only mentioned two eternal destinations. And it says the same thing in John 5, 29, Mark 16, 16, Daniel 12, 2, Acts 24, 15, Matthew 13, 30, 13, 49, and many other places point out that, you know, he'll separate the wheat from the chaff, uh, the good fish from the bad fish. It's always only two. There's never a third or a temporary place that you're going to be let out of. Besides, you see, you either know Jesus and you have a new born again spirit and new heart, new nature that's compatible with God's. If you don't and you go to hell or purgatory, well, you're not going to get that by spending time. Again, that would be the wrong premise. Time could never pay for sins. We're redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus, 1 Peter 1.18 says. So it's the blood that redeems us, not time. And so that's a whole wrong concept to believe in purgatory. And, you know, God cannot take us in our fallen state that man is in. Uh, he cannot take us to heaven the way we are. Revelation 21, 27 says he'll let nothing in the heaven that defiles or corrupts. Mm -hmm. So, see, his nature is different than ours. People have to understand this. And I just explain this for a minute. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, Hebrews 12, 29 and Nahum 1, 5 said God is a consuming fire. And in Nahum 1, 5 says all of us would be consumed at his presence. And our fallen sinful nature, we'd be consumed in his presence because he's so holy. So how can we ever appear before a holy God? Well, he has to give us a new nature. You know, it, it's like this. If I stuck my hand into the fire to retrieve something and the fire burned me, I wouldn't say, why did that fire burn me? That was mean of that fire. I wouldn't say that. Why? Because the nature of the fire is to burn. My hand and fire are not compatible. Well, neither is sinful man and holy God compatible. Wow. He has to give us a new nature, and the only way he gives us that is if we will trust in what Jesus did on the cross. He considers our trust as if we were righteous, just like we've never sinned. If we cast our care on him, our sins, and he takes our sins, washes them away with his blood, and we receive him as our Lord and Savior, then he considers our trust in the cross, not our works of righteousness, like Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So we're trusting in what he did on the cross. Then he considers our trust as if we were righteous, gives us a new heart and a new spirit that's compatible with God's. Now mm -hmm. he can let us into heaven because he gave us a new heart and spirit because we were trusting in his son. And then he dealt with our sins and washed them away. Wow. Wow, that's it's a that wonderful is, plan that God came up with. That is such a beautiful illustration how you presented with fire and the hand, the the that sinful nature and God's holiness. They're not compatible. This is why we cannot go to heaven of good works, trying right. harder, being better humans. We have to be born again. We have yeah. to experience forgiveness that Jesus offers today. Through forgiveness. And then, Bill, could you, when you when you were in our church, I forever rem I will forever remember the illustration that you left um, us with before you gave a call to salvation about people in on Titanic how there were oh, three yeah. types of people on Titanic until Titanic sunk and then there was only two types of people could you share that story and could you lead people who don't know the Lord into yes. that relationship with him right now yes you know when the Titanic set sail there were all different religions all different walks of life and they say there were three classes of people on that ship, the lower, the middle, and the upper class. But when the ship went down at the White Star Line office in Liverpool, England, there were two signs posted. And the people would wait anxiously each day as a man would come out to write their relative's name down on one of the signs. Now, one sign said known to be saved. The other sign said known to be lost. Now, when the ship left, there were all different beliefs, all different walks of life, and three classes of people. But in the end... There are only two. You are either saved or you're lost. And it's your choice. Because God loves us, he gives us that free will to choose. But there's consequences for our actions. You know, there's a consequence for our wrong decisions. And you're not automatically saved. There needs to be a purposeful act on our part if you want to enter heaven. 
And one last verse, Revelation 20, 15 says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God has a book and he's gonna look to see if our names are in his book. Mm -hmm. And the worst words you could ever hear would be, depart from me into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. He would have to say those words because he gave you that free will to choose and you chose to push him away. But if you're today, if you're willing to repent of your sin, ask forgiveness, that just means you have a humble heart and you say, Lord, I can't save myself. I'm a sinner and I don't want to sin anymore. I want to turn away from my sin and I agree, I want to follow Jesus. That's true repentance. If you're willing to do that, Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, unless a man repent, you shall all likewise perish. And one more verse, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. You have to believe it in your own heart and confess him with your own mouth. If you aren't willing to do that, then just say this prayer, repeat this prayer after me. This is going to come from your heart. It'll change your whole eternity. Say, dear God in heaven, I know that I'm a sinner and I cannot save myself. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross for me, that he was crucified, died and was buried, but rose again and lives forevermore. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I'm sorry. I repent. I turn from my sin. Come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. You are the Son of God. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you for taking me to heaven. And I now confess. I'm a born-again Christian Amen. going to heaven, and I'll serve you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise yeah. God. If you if you said it. that, if they said that, go tell somebody what you've done, because Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. So go tell somebody the good news of what you've done. Amen. And if you prayed that prayer today, watching this or re-watching this, listening on the podcast later down uh, the road or listening in a different language we translate this into russian and spanish and many more languages down the road um, let us know in the comments i prayed the prayer with bill i gave my life to christ and go tell somebody live for jesus live for the lord and bill if somebody wants to learn a little bit more about your ministry or get your book 23 minutes um, in hell or any other resources how can they do that our website is uh, soulchoiceministries.org soul s-o-u-l choice ministries.org or 23 minutes in hell.org and we have many podcasts short video teachings books we have five different books and all kinds of material that will really help you grow and you can watch everything for free and or order whatever you want so uh, we'd be glad to send you whatever you request and if you're a pastor watching you know, and you would love to have Bill in your church, you go on this website as well. Uh, he is a phenomenal, um, not only a speaker, but a minister. And it's uh, a great, when we had it, when we had him, so many people responded to the gospel because of the clear presentation about the gospel that you give, scriptural ba scripture based and, and also this vision that the Lord has given you. And it really connects with people. I feel like the scales fall off and some of the hardest hearts get broken before the lord so uh bill thank you you and your wife for this um for your willingness and your generosity with your time uh, to spend some time with us today and thousands of people that were watching right now and will be re-watching as well well vlad thank you so much for having me it's an honor for me to be with you and i appreciate the opportunity to get the word of god out to people so thank you for what you do and we we love you and we're thank so you. blessed to know you thank you again for having me i really appreciate it Thank you, Bill. God bless. Mm -hmm. And guys, um, if you've enjoyed this, I would like to um, invite you right now to um, let me know in the comments, drop that fire emoji in the comments if this was a blessing to your life. And as well as um, we're dropping links to Bill's ministry right now and we will leave them below the video. If the Lord puts on your heart to um, donate toward His ministry. The links are there as well. If God puts on your heart to uh, support our ministry, and we will also send something from our ministry to bless His efforts, His and His wife's efforts to spread the good news of Jesus Christ all around the world that they are doing. The links also are 
below this video right now as well below this video you can do that on cash app venmo we really appreciate each and every one of you that has given giving and who has partnered with our ministry before we appreciate you uh, doing that so we're dropping links right now if the lord's blessed you and you're like hey i want to be able to support this i believe in this ministry um, we're dropping those links and we will um, send that blessing to bill uh, tonight as well in our ministry we um, translate books into different languages create courses as well as we create um reading plans i just got a um, handwritten note from you version bible app management where out of fifteen thousand reading plans our plans were most engaging in the last month top 50 and so a lot of people are receiving from this ministry and and to each and every one of you that's watching supporting sharing and financially blessing this ministry this is also your fruit because um we're, we're doing it together and in fact next tuesday after our fast um, in the evening, we will have a partner's call, people who have given to this ministry uh, in the last um, uh, three to four months, and we will have a separate a special meeting, and I'm really looking forward to that. And so, um, guys, thank you, each and every one of you uh, that have joined today on this live stream. want to give you just a quick reminder, as I have done in the beginning of the stream, um, that uh, we made a big announcement that the Lord has done good work in our life that we've been waiting for 13 years and we are grateful for that so if you missed that announcement make sure you check your email because most likely we sent you on the email that reminder and that good news as well as this Sunday I'll be preaching at our church Hungry Gen if you are anywhere nearby um, welcome to come and say hi and then next week I will be in Italy um, in Mil 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 Milan uh, uh, Italy for a young adults conference and it's on my website as well would love to see you there if you are anywhere near Italy um, that city or just even if you're in a different country in Europe it's easy to fly from one country to another I feel like uh, countries in Europe are like states in the United States they're, they're pretty small and so uh, would love to see you in Europe I don't go a lot to Europe maybe once a year or once in a few years actually in December I will be in Romania Romania I will be for New Year's so I'm really excited for that as well and um, and then the other part that I wanted to mention for those of you that are just um, tuning in right now and that is um, if you haven't gotten the book host the Holy Spirit um, make sure that we're going to drop the link as well go to Amazon and if you have for every book that you read guys always just kind of develop a habit to show your appreciation by dropping a review on Amazon because it helps authors and so um, so don't forget to drop a review on Amazon it will mean a lot and uh, my wife restarted um, her YouTube she has been, been really a great blessing to a lot of women and because of the pregnancy she has um, stopped uploading um, but yesterday she restarted that and so um, show her uh, show her some support um, really appreciate that and um and the last thing before i let you guys go and that is we moved our fasting community from facebook to telegram in fact we are streaming right now to telegram from my understanding and so every once in a while i'll be jumping to telegram and actually kind of sharing some of what the lord is doing so we're dropping the link right now go ahead and head over to telegram telegram is a free messaging app that you can download and um, join our community it's a closer community there and I'll drop a little something uh, there before we go to sleep with my wife just to kind of bless you guys um, in there and so um, so join our closer community there on telegram would love to see you there um, each and every one of you appreciate you and then I will see you once again next week for the three-day fast and Pastor Ilya is in the chat um, everybody say hello to Pastor Ilya and um, God bless you guys and next week is going to be incredible whole week as we're doing the prayer we're doing fasting different teachings that the Lord has given me and um, the next week's stream I'm going to keep it a surprise and um, and then a lot of good stuff is going to come out next week so thank you guys each and every one of you blessings and I will see you uh, once again next week